I am happy. Hello. Bonne nuit. Héroïne à Bruce Grove le 2 mai 2015 à Bruce Grove à Tottenham célibataire night Sakana na Mango Magui Ramazani ya yo et ce qu'elle a jamais qu'on raté et rata raté Poussana Magui Ramazani à Fanda et soit Bango spécial guest Elvis Kemayo Balobi Kamikaze Kamikaze Life Music Coco Gabana à cause de la bande 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 de la From Bloomberg TV Africa, in Kinshasa, Eleni Jokos, in Lagos, Boson Nomafaye, and Uche Okoronkwo. Hello and welcome to African Business Weekly. I'm Eleni Jokos and I come to you from the bustling city Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo on Boulevard du 30 Juin, uh, which is the main artery connecting the city. As you can see, infrastructure is booming, but it's not the case across the country. Coming up on the show today, an exclusive interview with Prime Minister Augustin Matata Ponyo will be telling us about how they plan to achieve 15% growth by 2016. Now, Nigeria is also looking to increase loans to farmers by 7.5% next year. We'll be speaking to Agriculture Minister Akimumi Adeshino about how the country plans to reap the benefits of the sector. And Nestle is looking to pass on an increase in operational costs to consumers as countries like Nigeria implement uh, fiscal austerity measures. We'll be speaking to Executive Vice President of Asia, Oceania, and Africa, Nandu Ndankishore. First up, though, let's take a look at your top stories. Anglo-American has shortlisted 10 potential buyers for its Union Platinum mine, as the company looks to shrink its South African business. The world's largest producer of the white metal hopes to sell the mine for $300 million in the first half of next year. Nigerian cement prices are expected to regain some ground next year. This according to Lafarge Africa, who had to lower prices due to a slump in Africa's biggest economy. Cement prices fell 22% in November due partly to fluctuations in the local currency. And finally, Saudi star agricultural development, an Ethiopian company owned by billionaire Mohammed Al Amudi, plans to invest $100 million in a rice farm next year. The project is part of a government plan to establish commercial farms on 3.3 million hectares of fertile land in sparsely populated parts of the country. Let's take a look at how markets performed across the continent this week. Here in Nigeria, the continued sell-off in oil weighed on the Bourse and the Naira. Now, adding to the bad news, 24 companies have three months to comply with the exchange's rules or could be delisted. Uh, meanwhile, an embargo placed on Oando's rights offer was lifted. It raised about $264 million through issuing 2 billion ordinary shares. Now, the company was down over 9% at one point this week. 
In Kenya, markets started the week with a bang, with locals dominating activity and minimal participation uh, from foreign investors. Now, most sectors posted uh, gains. Equity Bank uh, signed a $62 million deal with the European Investment Bank on the back of high demand for loans. Uh, the money will be channeled towards smaller and medium-sized companies. Now, a large portion of its loan book is already dedicated to SMEs. Last year, it advanced more than 170,000 loans to the sector worth about $412 million. Over in South Africa, the JSC had a volatile week as the tumbling oil price saw commodity shares losing ground. Anglo-American platinum was lower after it issued a profit warning. Annual profit is expected to fall by 20%, of course hurt by the five-month-long strike in the sector. Now, the miner has shared assets and is looking to sell more mines next year. The Democratic Republic of Congo is targeting 15% growth by 2016. That's almost double its current growth rate. Now, for decades, the Central African country's development has been hampered by poor infrastructure and governance. But its mineral resources and labor force could potentially make it one of the world's richest nations. In an exclusive interview, I caught up with Prime Minister Augustin Matata Ponyo. We need several billion U.S. dollars. Our need could be more than 20 billion. The Inga project alone, it's 12 billion dollars. And there are several hydroelectric plants in the country. There are several roads, several thousands of kilometers that need tarmacking. There are several sailing routes that need refurbishment. And there are planes, flight companies that need to be created. In short, we need tens of billions of US dollars to boost the Congolese economy via a diversified infrastructure system compatible with our country's vision. You're talking about Grand Inga. You're alluding to various projects, which, of course, are going to impact the country as a whole. Are investors knocking at your door? And has the policy environment changed where it's now conducive for foreign investment? Depuis un certain temps. Indeed, for some time now, there are a lot of private companies who want to come and invest in our country, which was not the case a few years ago. And this is just because the financial potential is high. There are several sectors in which the private companies can invest. You've got the hydrocarbon, oil, power, infrastructure, agriculture, mining sectors. In short, there is as much potential in this country as there is interest. Secondly, we're working a lot on improving the business environment. We're currently fighting to improve our ranking in the Doing Business Index. And as you know, the Democratic Republic of Congo has been ranked among the top 10 countries for reforms in the world. For example, in 2014, there are already nearly 7,000 enterprises that have been created which is a figure much higher than last year when we had registered just over 1,000 new enterprises. So we're on a path where the private sector is taking off. How do you plan to broaden your tax base? Of course, most of the revenue right now is coming through from the mining sector. We know that corporate tax is very high. What are you planning to do to diversify revenues? Effectivement, le secteur privé. Indeed, the private sector is the driver of growth, the driver of wealth creation. We strongly believe in this, not because we're economists, but because this is the example given by the world's wealthiest country. Regarding the Democratic Republic of Congo in particular, the measures we are currently putting in place have the purpose to promote the private sector and reduce its taxes to allow it to move forward and to grow its operations. Firstly, the taxation rate is not 40% anymore. It's been lowered to 35% thanks to the measure we implemented. The value-added tax, which allows for better returns for investors. We also started the OHADA, which allows for external jurisdiction outside the DRC. It's the African Law Organization, and this allows for a jurisdiction giving better justice for all investors who haven't been satisfied with internal jurisdiction. There's also the DRC's compliance with the New York Convention on Arbitrary Sentences. This is also something that allows more safety for financial operators who invest in our country. Looking at Grand Inga, this could be a game changer for the country and electrify the entire DRC, if not the entire region. But we know that there's been problems with Inga 1 and 2. It's not operating at full capacity. Are we going to see similar issues? Because this is all about distribution. It's not only about energy generation. Today, the Inga project is led in a professional manner. Feasibility studies are being done, and the process of mobilizing the private partners, multilateral and bilateral, is led in a professional manner. Today, the Inga project tries to secure all the partners, whether it's inside or outside the country. The Inga 3 project should produce a bit more than 4,000 megawatts, half of which should be consumed within the country, and the other half should help provide electricity to African nations, especially South Africa.
So today, I think the way that this project is led in a professional manner further reassures the partners interested in building this mega project. And I have to say, in all honesty, that the current power shortfall is a burden to the Congolese economy. The achievement of this project towards 2019-2020 will provide the needed energies and boost the Congolese economy. Well, that was the DRC's Prime Minister, Ogusan Matata Ponyo. We're going to a short break, and when we return, we take a look at Nigeria's plans to increase loans to farmers by 7.5% next year. Don't you go anywhere. Welcome back to African Business Weekly. Nigeria's agriculture sector grew 9% in the third quarter, a rise of almost three percentage points from the same period last year. The country's agriculture minister, Akimumi Adeshina, spoke to us about plans to further stimulate growth by increasing loans to the sector by 7.5% in 2015. Nigeria used to be known for cocoa, and I want us to become a big player uh, in the cocoa global market. And to do that, uh, we have to do a couple of things. First and foremost is we had to uh, replant our aging cocoa plantation. The Cocoa Research Institute of Nigeria uh, released um, eight new hybrids of cocoa. And these are fantastic cocoa varieties because they allow us to give, get yields that are five times what farmers were traditionally getting. But also uh, the cocoa varieties uh, mature in two and a half years instead of five years normally. So not only are we getting a shorter duration variety, but we're also getting a variety that performs very well in terms of uh, our yield performance. Um, we are doing three million pods, these high yielding cocoa pods for farmers in the country. Uh, and that translates into a total of 141 million seedlings that we're going to uh, give all of our farmers. So far, you know, we have done right now 1.4 million pods of those and that translates uh, into roughly about 50 million seedlings that we have given to our farmers. And what that basically tells you is that's enough to plant 45,000 hectares of new cocoa plantations. And so as these new varieties come on board, we're going to see big increase in cocoa production coming from Nigeria. How are you helping Nigerian farmers cope with the black pot disease? And so we started something called Cocoa GES. You know, we have a program in Nigeria in which we give uh, farm support to our farmers over mobile phones. And so they're getting their seeds and fertilizers and chemicals via electronic vouchers in their mobile phones. And we're doing that for cocoa farmers. So they're getting insecticides, they're getting herbicides, and they're getting uh, fertilizers all via electronic coupons on their mobile phone. But our plan is that by 2016, 2017, as this new high yielding cocoa varieties begin to come upstream, I think you will see Nigeria easily hit 600, 600 700,000 metric tons uh, of cocoa. And our goal is to be able to be same level as Ivory Coast as 1 million metric tons in a few years. Cocoa output is expected to miss its target by 10% this year. Is that a reality? Absolutely not. There's no way that's going to happen. I mean, our black pot disease infestation as a country has not changed in terms of level uh, severity from any past two or three years. Farmers say 9% interest rate on agriculture is still too high. What's important is not so much how low the interest rate is. I know some folks who want to have money for free, but there's no free lunch anywhere. The fact of the matter is, as we fix the agricultural value chains and we re lower the risk embedded in those chains, whether it's cassava, whether it's rice, whether it is cocoa, whatever it is, it's easier for banks to lend. And I'll give you some of the reasons that are happening in Nigeria today. You know, when I became minister, the total amount of bank portfolio exposed to the agricultural sector as a share of total lending by the agricultural sector was 0.7% of all the entire portfolio. You know, we were able today, we had 5% of the total bank lending portfolio in agriculture. And I expect by next year, we will reach 7.5%, and hopefully another year we reach 10%. 
That was Nigeria's Agriculture Minister Akiwumi Adeshino. Now, militant insurgencies across West Africa are weighing on food company Nestle's business in the region, adding to the pressures of currency depreciation, high inflation, and the Ebola outbreak. Now, this is according to the company's executive vice president for Asia, Oceania in Africa, Nandu Nanki Shore, who believes consumers could come under pressure due to the implementation of fiscal austerity measures. Nestle has always been interested in Africa and our products have been available in Africa for a long time. I believe one of our first factories ever outside of Europe was in South Africa. And uh, we have been in Africa. Africa is one of our fastest growing regions. We, can, we have been investing here and we continue to invest. Why do we continue to invest? The expectation is that by the end of this century, one in every four people in the world is going to be African. So this is where we have to be. This is where long term we will have the mouths to feed. And this is where there will be business. Now, what growth prospects do you see in your operations in Central and West Africa? Uh, it has been a growth engine for us over the last decade. We expect it's going to continue to be a growth engine uh, because of all the underlying dynamics which I mentioned of uh, demographic growth, urbanization, digital enabling of people. All these are engines which are going to continue to give economic growth. You will have people who will emerge out of poverty into middle class and that's a source of growth because they will consume, particularly in urban areas, goods and services and food products. You also have an emergence of middle class moving into affluence who are uh, who wish to consume goods and services that are uh, consumed by the affluent all over the world. So we will see growth happening at all tiers of the demographic pyramid. Do you think currency devaluation, rise in interest rate and fiscal austerity measures in countries such as Nigeria is a temporary measure? When you have depreciating currencies, which in turn leads to imported inflation, then that imported inflation has to be dealt with. How we deal with it is, first of all, we make sure we do not compromise on the quality of our products. That is uh, uh, non-negotiable. Quality is something we maintain. Within that quality, we look at raw material substitution. Are there some substitutions that we can make without compromising nutritional value, without compromising the taste delivery? Can we make substitutions depending on the relative prices of the ingredients and raw materials, which also fluctuate? Then we continue to invest in the basics, in doing efficiency to make sure we reduce our fixed costs so we can minimize the price increases we have to pass on to the consumers. Once you have done all of these, we take price increases. Now talk to us about the increase in competition. Competition is a fact of life and uh, all over the world we find competition. We find sometimes competition is from uh, the multinationals. Competition is coming from local players. Yeah. And fundamentally, if you step back and you look at it from a big picture, uh, you have to say this is good for society. It's good for society that there is competition. It's good for consumers that there is competition because competition forces us to raise our game. It forces us to make sure we are price competitive, forces us to make sure we are cost competitive, forces us to innovate, to make sure we continue to offer products that taste better and are better nutritionally than competition. If you didn't have competition, the risks are great that one would fall into complacency. So competition can be challenging or can be bitter in the short term, but in the long term, it's always good. And that was Nandu Nandiki Shore, Nestle's Executive Vice President for Asia, Oceania and Africa. And after the break, we take a look at how South African financial services firm Alexander Forbes has benefited from capital restructuring. Don't go away. Business Weekly. Now, South African financial services firm Alexander Forbes returned to profits in the first half of the year, and that's after changing its capital structures in preparation for its initial public offering in July. Now, the company returned to the Johannesburg Stock Exchange after delisting in 2007 following an $800 million private equity buyout. Bronwyn Seaborn caught up with CEO Edward Kiswetter. Let's take a look. 
I don't think it's the capital restructuring necessarily that um, is the only driver of profitability. It's the work we've done over five years to build the deep fundamental drivers for growth in our business. So what are they? Firstly, it's growth in assets under management. And we work quite hard. We've implemented a strong uh, new business focus uh, that yields positive results. We report today a 3.1 billion of assets um, under management um, uh, in the investment solutions business. We report 129 new clients um, in uh, our financial services advice business. We report um, additional um, growth in membership numbers. Then we have exceptionally high retention values. Those are the real drivers of growth. The capital restructuring obviously means that going forward, we will pay less money to service debt because of our low gearing, and therefore we can return a lot more of that money, firstly to our profit line, and secondly to shareholders or, if we need to, to reinvest. You haven't declared a dividend. Why are you keeping cash on the balance sheet? There are a number of once-off charges um, that will go to our income statement. There are also, importantly, a number of regulatory requirements for cash. So when we came to the listing, if you go through our pre-listing statement, we were very clear that said we will therefore not declare a dividend in the first six months. And secondly, we will review that, permission, that position at the end of the full financial year. And we're still sticking to that guidance. Are you not paying a dividend because you're also looking for capital to grow? Our capital requirement to fund growth is relatively low. Um, our growth into Africa, um, we have stated before one, it is focused on sub-Saharan Africa, mainly because it's English speaking and we are aligned in that respect. Secondly, we follow pension fund reform. Thirdly, we lead with advice. Um, and then we look for low capital um, acquisition opportunities that make sense. Maybe a small business that's already in a country where we want to be, if we can start a strategic alliance, maybe acquire the business. Um, but our capital requirements to fund that growth is very low. Alexander Forbes has said that you are eyeing potential acquisition targets across the continent, looking at Tanzania, Malawi, Ghana. How advanced are those discussions? The countries we're focusing on, as I mentioned before, in, uh, in West Africa, we'll, we'll be we're already in Ghana, in, in Nigeria, so naturally looking in Ghana is an ob obvious opportunity. Um, and secondly, on the East African side, uh, we are already in Kenya, but we have a fledgling business in Uganda, which is obviously nice if we can expand our business there, and to re-enter Tanzania. That was Alexander Forbes, CEO Edward Kisveta. Now, Australian-based South Boulder Mines is looking to develop its Koluli Potash project in Eritrea and is currently conducting a pre-feasibility study. Now, Koluli is one of only three major global deposits that contains kainite salt in solid form. Now, Ijoma Ndukwe spoke to CEO Paul Donaldson about plans for the project. The Kaluli Potash project is in Eritrea, East Africa, but there's over a billion tonnes of potassium bearing salts. We're three quarters of the way through a pre-feasibility study for the production of potassium sulphate, uh, which is a form of potash, uh, commonly known as sulphate of potash. We've got a unique combination of salts in the resource that are suitable for low energy, high potassium yield, uh, ambient temperature conversion uh, to potassium sulphate. Our pre-feasibility study will be complete in February 2015 and then we'll move straight into bankable feasibility study which is due for completion in mid-2015. Can you talk through your production and construction timelines? In terms of construction, uh, the information that we're receiving currently from our pre-feasibility study has us on a two-year construction schedule. Our timeline in general is to finish the definitive feasibility study by mid-2015 and immediately seek funding for the development of the project. And we factored in a timeline of a year to get the funding to get us to construction. With the two-year construction timeline, that should bring us into production in mid-2018. Now, potash prices declined back in early 2013. How do you intend to navigate commodity prices coming under pressure? 
Porash types are differentiated by chemistry. And so when people talk about the potash price being depressed, they're actually talking about potassium chloride, which is one form of potash. The material that we will produce from the Kaluli resource in the startup phase is potassium sulfate, which carries a substantial premium over potassium chloride. For us, uh, now is the right time to bring this project into production. There is a shortage of this commodity and we have a great resource to fill the gap uh, between supply and demand. And what are your key growth markets? Key target markets for us uh, are really in our own backyard in the first instance. That includes the Middle East, uh, Northern Africa, Egypt's a big consumer of potassium sulphate, and in the longer term India is, is an ideal target market. Time now to turn our attention to you, the viewer. And with South African power utility ESCOM struggling to meet the country's power demands, we asked whether government should privatise the sector. Well, Edwin Molenkamp said that ESCOM had proven its inability to meet the country's power demands, which left no choice but to privatise the sector. And Timmy Sholaya tweeted that deregulation was more effective and crucial than simply privatising. While Lilita Malati added that ESCOM should not be privatised but must be open to consider innovative funding structures that the private sector can offer. Well, we'd love to keep a hearing from you. And in light of World AIDS Day, do you think the Ebola outbreak in West Africa has overshadowed the fight against HIV AIDS? Well, you can send us your thoughts via Twitter at Bloomberg TV Afri, or you can find us on Facebook. Now, if you want to watch this episode again, be sure to visit our website, www.bloombergtvafrica.com. From me, Uche Okoronkwam. And from me, Bosin Mopaye. It's goodbye. Enjoy the new offer from Leica Mobile. No more facial hair, no more embarrassment. I've always been self-conscious of my hairline, so putting my hair back, this will be perfect for me. The secret, a brand new and improved patented pulsed Thermacon technology. The result, you get the smooth, sexy skin you've always wanted. With No-No, it's like having a top quality treatment in your own home. It's fantastic. And there's a No-No for him too. It looks like, just like you've got a fresh wax, but like you don't have to go through all the pain. When you order, we'll send you the new cordless No-No Pro in your choice of colours. Featuring an LCD display, it comes with up to five treatment levels. Plus, we'll include everything you need to get rid of your unwanted hair. A set of Thermacon tips specially designed for your face and body. A buffer pad to exfoliate and polish your skin. Plus, we'll also send you the No-No Travel Case as a bonus gift. Unwanted facial hair is an embarrassment, but with no-no, that's not a problem anymore. It's the easiest thing to use, and it's just changed my life. Radiancy, the makers of no-no, will let you try it at home for not just 30 days, but 60 days, with a money-back guarantee. If you use no-no for 60 days and are not 100% satisfied, we'll refund the purchase price. Say no to shaving. No to waxing. Get the professional looking results you want right in the comfort of your home with the new NoNo -No Pro. Call or order online now. An army of women have already signed up to race for life. But if we're going to beat cancer sooner, we need thousands more. Ladies, it's time to step up and fill your trainers. Sign up now at raceforlife.org and we will be cancer sooner. Renting a car can be a little taxing on the brain. At Holiday Autos, we've done all the thinking for you. We compare suppliers, cars and prices in over 30,000 destinations. So we know who has cars available and who's offering great deals. We'll also tell you who gets the best reviews from our customers. It only takes a few minutes, so book your car today. Just search Holiday Autos. Oh, not a great shot.
Could have done a lot better if Charlie was still around. I still can't believe it. He was three years younger than me when he died. But it was a wake-up call. So I called British seniors and took out over 50's life insurance. That means the funeral expense is paid, and hopefully there'll be some money to pass on to the children. That wouldn't work for me, not with my blood pressure. There's no medical, no questions about your health. As long as you're a UK resident and aged between 50 and 79, you're guaranteed to be accepted. Premiums start from just £4.83 a month in the first year for a 50-year-old with £2,000 of cover. You're covered for accidental death straight away. And after just 12 months, you're covered for death by any cause worldwide.